Hey guys, Khali from Cricket Fanatics magazine here, and today with another special guest, Pommy Mbangwa. I've, I mean, the voice that I've been listening, listening to for years, as long as I can remember watching cricket. So, quite an important, important interview for me as a as a journalist, etc., and going into this industry. So, just I want to welcome you to the new platform. Uh, you haven't been on here before, so welcome, Pommy. How are you, Khalid? I'm fine, thanks, man. Um, how are you doing? In lockdown and everything. How do you keep saying? <laughs> um, yeah, this and that, you know, um, try and get into some sort of routine. It's not easy. Uh, I can't say that I've, I've managed to get into uh, a routine that I can say is productive. I, mm. however, try each day to kind of get something done, you know, whatever the something is, whether it's, um, read part of a book, whether it's, uh, get something done, um, on, online something like this so today perhaps this is uh my productive thing um uh, i uh my kids play piano so uh, mm -hmm. i said i said yesterday that i'll also start up again to to learn how to at least recognize the notes and and all of that <laughs> so so I, i'm yet to to do some practice today <laughs> <laughs> but i mean if you've played before you it's kind of like would you say riding a bike again or not um no i would be a lie to say i've played before i've started learning before okay. and then sort of um, very uh, shortly into learning have stopped because of i don't know so i might say a, a lack of commitment to it but mm. really uh my, i might be unfair to myself if i say that it's because I've been a bit busy when I've tried to do it and so I try and oh. squeeze in as many things as possible and and it seems to be the the one thing that that I could sort of take out of the schedule. Yeah, learning a musical instrument is tough. I mean, I've been playing guitar as well for like 13, 14 years. So like at the oh, beginning wow. stage, <laughs> so the beginning stages is quite tricky to get into the mode and get and especially with piano because it's two hands moving at the same time. So like drums or like or other things like a flute, uh, all of those things is two hands trying to work together. Are you playing melodies, chords already, or is it just melodies? No, at the I, I'm 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 literally starting up again. So yesterday <laughs> it was yesterday wow. that I decided this with the boys, and they have me going. Um, from middle C uh, with the right hand going that one way and I must do it with my left hand as well. So <laughs> yeah. just to, that's just to get it all kind of going um, again. And, and then I'm going to do, uh, I'm not sure if one of the books is close by, hold on two seconds. There's a, there's a book called, yeah, I think it's called Dozen a Day. Or it might be the other one. There's another one. Um, what is it, a hand or something? Uh, mini set, yeah, that's it. It's called a mini set, and I'm on book number one, and I'm awesome. like about page three or four, you know. So today is the next phase. I'll get in there and do the practices I was shown yesterday, and then see what I can play on in in the actual page on the book. So let's see how I go, you know. So maybe in a few few months' time, you're gonna hear you give some singing with the piano, and we can have some covers. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. I, uh, one of the boys, one of the boys remarked um, uh, a few days ago that, oh, wow, singing and playing at the same time is so difficult. So if I get there, if I get anywhere close to that, I'll be very happy. Okay, that's awesome, awesome. So yeah, yeah. I tell so you what, Khaled, you, you, I'll, and I'll take you up with this if you agree. You'll need to teach me how to play guitar. I've always wanted to. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'll take that up on it. Um, I mean, yeah, guitar is an amazing instrument to play. Um, I mean, at the beginning, dependable on what type of guitar you have. Um, I've started, I think, on a classical nylon string guitar, so it's obviously not as bad for me. But there were certain people that I have taught before that came with, with steel string guitars, and I told them, look here, guys, uh, <laughs> your fingers are going to be bleeding after a few times, so you need to maybe just go to nylon first. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I don't have a guitar, but at some yeah. point maybe get an acoustic one and uh, and try. I know there are a few guys, actually, a few musical cricketers um, mm. around the circuit who carry their their uh, guitars around. So yeah. uh, I suppose most popular, uh, most famous guy would probably be uh, Brett Lee. 
So he mm-hmm. carries his his guitar around, stay with Australia. I think Michael Slater also plays. But Mark Butcher, if you look, mm-hmm. if you actually go on iTunes, you will find Mark uh, like three albums of Mark Butcher. He wow. actually did something on Facebook recently where he wrote some song. It is a nice love song. It's brilliant. I don't know <laughs> how the guys do it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, don't, I don't. I don't know how they do it. But yeah. We Fantastic. know in the local setup as well, A.B. De Villiers and J.P. Dumini as well, that, that double around the guitar. Well, A.B. has an album, so... <laughs> yeah, so, so I know that A.B. sings. I don't know I don't know what instruments he plays, but those guys will be younger than I am, and so I don't <laughs> hang out in, in their spaces, so I don't really know what they get up yeah. to. J.P. recently has kind of shifted to the commentary side of things, so yeah. he sort of spend or have started to spend a little bit of time, yeah. so maybe... I'll be able to um, um, to see firsthand what he does musically, and yeah, I'm interested. Yeah, yeah. music always good. Yeah, it's always good. It's a nice way, and a lot of people. I had um, I don't even know about the Voice South Africa, but in the inaugural um, competition winner, um, um, Richard Sturton was on the show that in the week, and he was talking about when he started off as a cricketer, and he, and he talks about similarities between a music career, obviously, and cricket as well. So. That was quite interesting and quite entertaining to actually see that and hear that because he played Western Province under 13 cricket and he spoke about the similarities between that and music and so it was quite awesome and interesting. But um, you know what they say. You know what they say. Cricket is a metaphor for life. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I don't know if you've heard Mr. Graham October as well. Um, he's, he always likes to say that he says cricket teaches you the li- the stories that life or the lessons that life teach you. So it's always amazing to hear those things. But um, I want to hear about your life story and uh, starting off with your love for cricket. Um, how did that start initially, and how did that come about? Um, uh, as a youngster, I think like everybody else, the way it starts, I think it. You start as a, a little guy. Um, I think I was nine, nine going on ten, maybe. Um, and um, what I remember is a guy called Bob Blair, and I don't know if you would know him. Maybe I'm an old man. I don't know <laughs> if it goes if it if it goes back in as far as your your cricket history and whatever, but. Is from New Zealand, Bob Lair, if I'm not mistaken. And he came to our school um, and he came to, to teach us the game, you know, teach us to bowl, teach us to bat. Um, and and, that's, uh, and th- that was on concrete, concrete net. So back when I was in, in Zimbabwe and in junior school. So, yeah, I remember that vividly. I remember him with his... Uh, gray shirt on and um and i might be wrong by saying gray you know what happens as you go along your memories <laughs> kind of get they get edited don't they and it's normal, yeah. <laughs> it's normal. <laughs> That's That's normal. Everyone. it just depends how many how old you are how many years have gone by but i remember him having a white hat so a white wide brim hat and a gray shirt on and shorts and um and kind of on concrete nets at uh, Rhodes Estate Prep School, which is in Matopas in, in uh, Zimbabwe, just outside Bulawa. And, um, yeah, kind of introducing us to the game. We had to kind of pick up the bat, you know, like an axe off the ground. Um, we had to run up and try and bowl, keep your arms straight, you know, all of that stuff. Um, and since then, it, you know, took to it pretty much straight away, like many other sports. Um, and the distinction with regard to, you know, whether it was cricket I played or any other game, um, only came much later. I think 14, 15 um, is when I kind of made some sort of decision and felt that this is the sport that I, I love the most and this or rather the sport that I want to do the most post whatever, you know, or into the future and wanted to do it professionally. So yeah, about 14, 15, prior to that, um, every other sport, I played football, um, did athletics, played tennis, played rugby, whatever it was, you know, just because um, boarding school or just schools in general, where you get exposed to all these sports, 
you get to try absolutely everything. And um, I, I don't discriminate one sport against another uh, with regard to, you know, what is good or which is best or whatever it is. It's just a, a, a subjective choice in the end. You know, which one do you like? Which one do you choose? And, and for whatever reason. And cricket, I can't say why I chose it. I, I, I don't know. Um, uh, so many things, so many things are alike from sport to sport. So camaraderie, uh, discipline, skills, just um, um, the ethic of, of hard work, um, being coachable, you know, endeavor as in, you know, to try your best all the time, all that sort of stuff is in just about every single sport, whether, whether it be um, the camaraderie part out of it, you know, whether it be a, a, an individual sport or, or a team sport, you've got to have pretty much all of those things. So I don't know why in the end cricket was the one, but it's the one that bit. It's the one I decided I, I was going to do. And that love uh, has never waned to this day, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, the, that's it. Yeah, but I mean, obviously, talking about being in Zimbabwe, of course, um, what, how many opportunities were there for you as a, as a kid growing up for, for cricket? You know, in South Africa, we have plenty of opportunity over here to play the sport. It's, ex it's a lot of exposure. So for you, how, how difficult was it for you to get into the sport? Or was it quite easy for you to just find them to, to actually achieve your goals that you wanted to achieve? Yeah, th that's a, a, a question that requires a particular perspective because um, in the time I grew up, you, I mean, Zimbabwe, let's see, if I work it out to go to 1990, um, now it's probably 1985, 86, uh, when I was, gee, I've got to work out how old I am. 1983, 1984, 1985. So around, yeah, so 85, 86, I'm sort of 9, uh, 10, 11, you know. Um, I'm in that time, Zimbabwe is five years, six years out of independence. Um, in terms of who has access to absolutely everything, all of those uh, dynamics have to be uh, borne in mind in answering to say, is it easy enough for everyone or isn't it? And with regard to the population, population at the time, say of about um, 12 million people, um, perhaps it wasn't as extensive, um, the opportunity. But if you were in schools that played the game and there were many that did, then you, you got exposed to it. And um, that's kind of how it went. So it, it yeah. just really depended on where I was with regard to the school. And I, I was in a place that provided the sport when I was in junior school and when I was in senior school. So I was plugged into a school system that provided for um, opportunity to play the game and go through the ranks with regard to um, school, provincial and national selection. Yeah, so, wow. So for national selection, of course, you playing for Zimbabwe, etc. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about some of the highlights of your career. And, and also, I got a fan question in earlier today that someone wanted me to ask you about what it was like to play with someone like Andy Flower, who was arguably one of the best wicketkeeping batsmen of the, of the of the all time, people say, and obviously at the time, one of the best batsmen in the world. So can you maybe talk to me a little bit about that experience and, of course, about playing with him, yeah, so highlights for me personally, uh, where when I kind of decided that the game was it, it's what I wanted to do. Uh, it's quite funny because now I tell people, don't don't be like me. <laughs> Why I say that? Why I say that is because I think for me, destination was was kind of the goal because it seemed so unattainable at the time. So I wanted to to play cricket for Zimbabwe. I wanted to get into the Zimbabwe side. Um, but from where I sat at the time, it just looked an impossibility. You know, you kind of looked and thought, how am I going to do that? But I strove. I decided, well, I'll have a good go. Whoopsie, I'll 
and I'll fix that. I decided I'll have a, a good go at trying to get there. And kind of once having got there, I think for me, the job was done, if you know what I mean. Um, and so why I say to, to youngsters, don't try and be like me or don't be like me, is I don't think the destination is the goal when it comes to, to professional sport. You know, mm. the destination isn't the goal. You want to get into the team. But more than that, you want to make sure that when you get there, you that's the beginning you know so yeah i had an absolutely lovely time and i regret nothing by the way um i i absolutely love that i that i got there i absolutely love how um how kind of things went and the experience so they make me who i am you know um and yeah playing with various guys and you know, going to the 99 world cup that's got to be a high my test debut has got to be the the highlight for sure. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. I, I'll never forget it. Played against Pakistan in Faisalabad and uh, got a couple of wickets. We got smashed in the game, <laughs> but I remember I remember the feeling of getting a wicket, uh, my first wicket, and and kind of feeling like I'm walking on air. As I speak about it now, I get goosebumps still. <laughs> it's weird. Wow. it's weird how that works. I don't think it'll ever go away. Um, so that's a highlight playing uh, playing in 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 that first Test match, taking a wicket. Um, and then going to the 1999 World Cup um, as a side, there were a few things that weren't going so well off the field and there were squabbles and, and, and all sorts that, that went on prior to the tour. But there was a belief within the guys that we could do well. Um, and it's so cool and so good in sport when you kind of picture something and you then get it done. You know, at the end, we were happy we did well, but there were many guys within that side, if not absolutely everyone, who felt, you know what, we could have done even better still, you mm. know? So yeah. to me, that, that's just fabulous as a, um, as a lesson, as, a, um, as, a, as a, an example of set a goal and, and, and achieve it. Yeah, so yeah, if I, to, if I were to pick things, those would be the two things um, I would pick out as as highlights, as, as things that kind of, I kind of still look back on particularly fondly, fonder than many yeah. other things, I guess. Yeah, so you must, you've played against a lot of legends that are regarded legends of the game, obviously being in that period. I mean, we, we know about it. I had one of them, Lance Klusen was over here on the show talking mm -hmm. about that experience as well. And I mean, you would have seen guys in their absolute prime. So can you tell me about some of those guys that you faced and some of the toughest opposition ones that you faced, the players that you faced? <clears throat> uh, yeah, look. Um, when you th when I think of the guys you play against, I mean the the first thing that you do is kind of go, okay, so you know the Tendulkars of this world, the um, uh, Wasim Akrams of this world, Dravid Ganguly, um, Said Anwar is a particularly. I don't know. I know that he's not lauded as one of the, mm -hmm. the greats of the game per se but me personally maybe because we played pakistan a few times i thought he was absolutely legendary as a batsman he's just a touch a touch of a surgeon so you think of hashim amla um in modern day like now and go back to um to Said anwar just such a player is unbelievable and as i look around i mean brian lara um uh, you go around the traps and they're guys who are really good players. I look mainly, though, from a bowler's eye because there were guys that I, I had idolized as a youngster mm. who I ended up um, playing against. You know, um, I remember playing in the West Indies and I'm playing against Kurt Lee Ambrose. I, I, I think I was, uh, I must have been like 23, 24 at the time. And this was weird because... I had a picture of the guy on my wall, you know, when I was, <laughs> at, when yeah. I was a teenager. You know? so, so that's, it's kind of weird how that works. But here you are on this field with this very guy who you kind of thought, hey, this, this guy is legendary. And he's in one team, you're in another, and you just have to get on with the job of trying to beat him. You know, so yeah, absolutely fabulous to, to have that sort of experience. I don't I think at the time, though, um, every time there's like this, the initial feeling, 
And the initial feeling might be one of like, oh, wow, that's good, Lee Ambrose. Or, oh, wow, that's so-and-so, and that's such and such, right? But there's the job to do, you know? Yeah. There's the com competitive nature. I'm going to beat you, whoever you are. Um, it doesn't matter. And at that time, as good as they are, they're not yet legendary, right? They, they're just other cricketers like yourself. <laughs> and only after that time do you then go, oh, wow, you know? How, you know, I didn't know. I mean, how, how would I have known? I might have thought, wow, this guy's going to be called a legend in some time. Whoever you're talking about, Shane Warne, Morley Duran, um, any number of me, Courtney Walsh, um, go through the traps, the England captains, you know, Atherton, Hussein, uh, all these guys play against all of them, um, Wazim and Waka. And you're like, yeah, just opposition. Hey, how's it going, mate? Blah, 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 blah play, try and beat them, they try and knock your head off, whatever the case may be, and away you go. And time goes by. How would I have known that post that time, I would have been in broadcasting and mm. kind of still with them rather than against them in, in terms of teams and so forth, and kind of still in this world that is cricket and is a part of cricket. I couldn't have known, you know? Yeah. So that's amazing because what was your calling? Because I'm when I'm talking about you talking about your heroes that you that you would have seen and you played with them and then obviously you don't realize it. Like with well, the same with journalism, we when I started before, I looked up to a lot of these heroes like A.B. de Villiers, etc. And then the first time comes around and you get to interview them and you just like, wait, but I need to be professional here. You can't fan out. You need to stay, you need to stay calm, you need to ask your questions, get it done. And then afterwards you reminisce and you're like, Wow, did that really happen? It's a guy that you idolized your whole life and now he's sitting right in front of you, so it's unbelievable. But your calling with regards to broadcasting and how that happened and what was it that drew you to that particular job title or that industry? So I believe in God and I, I, I think that with the way things have worked, it could only be a, a path carved out by God, right? I, because I couldn't, I couldn't have said to anyone, I plan to do X, Y, or Z with regard to broadcasting. I couldn't have that. I didn't. In fact, I remember. So I, I remember I used to sit up in the Wanderers scoreboard uh, scoring area during the times of being in the South African Cricket Academy. I had to come here for a year uh, prior to playing international cricket. And I used to mock commentate. Because I used to go up, you used to have to go up. I was injured actually at the time, I remember. And I used to have to go up there and identify the players. Everyone in the same colors. Um, the, the, I mean, the, I, I'll tell you who was in that academy year, uh, the intake. So there was an A side that was going to, to England. And in that A side uh, were Roger Telemarcus, H.D. Ackerman, uh, Nick Pothas. Jacques Callis, um, blah, 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 Greg Smith. Um, gee, I forget who the other guys were in in that side, in 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 the A side. But in the in the whole intake, um, Jeff Toyana, who's now a coach, Carl Bradfield from the Eastern Cape, Cedric English, Murray Crook. Uh, there was Joseph Angara from Kenya, and there was Paul Adams, Mark Boucher. Ashwell Prince, um, Antini, um, gee, and I'll forget some guys, sure. Pierre De Brain, um, uh, who else? I'm trying to think who else would have, would have been there. But if I say 90% of that intake played international cricket, and some of them, um, Jacques Kellis, um, Mark Boucher, um, Coco Adams, um, Ashwell Prince, Antini. Um, and Adam Bafa, it was Doug Watson as well, who was there, who played for the Dolphins for a long time and played in the A-side. So all these guys um, were in this intake. And some of these guys became legends of the game, you know? So here I am at this academy, and we're playing games. We had matches every weekend. And I was injured the one time. I'd injured my back. And I had to sit upstairs in the commentary box, in the, in the score box, 
and identify the players for the scorers. Mm. And I'd, yeah, yeah, that one, so-and-so, that one, so-and-so. And then I would mock commentate just to be sick. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and in mock commentate, and they'd say, oh, you should do that. You, you should be a commentator. And I said, Phew, I would never do that. Why did I say I would never do that? Who wants to be criticizing players who are doing as, you know, doing the best they can, working as hard as they can? No, I would never do that. That's not a job for me. Those guys up there, they're terrible. They just have a go all the time. And that was the perspective from very yeah. early on. And, the, and you can understand that perspective from players because playing is, it, it's precious. You're, on, you're, you're under pressure. Um, you hold it so dear. And your space, your spot is always on the line. Everything is performance-based. Mm -hmm. So when anyone even has an inkling of criticism, you don't take it well. I know I didn't take it well, you know, and I don't expect any other player to take it well because you're protective of you, you're protective of your efforts, you know, and it's not so easy to face the objective, brutal truth. You, 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 you see it subjectively. You think, oh, that guy doesn't like me, but... You know, and, and you tend to hear only the horrible things or what you term horrible. And so why I say the path was made by God is because um, right up until I commentated at the 2003 World Cup, mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't see it as a, as a, a job to do. I, I, I was a cricketer. I wanted to play cricket and I wanted to play cricket till I couldn't walk anymore you know and i wanted to do so for zimbabwe till i couldn't walk anymore and at the time felt it was my uh right because i felt i was good enough to be picked every time so with every non-selection there'd be disappointment um with everything that went on there'd just be oh i should be playing i should be playing i should be playing and in the 2003 world cup i got a let uh, an, a call from the broadcasters to say hey uh we got your numbers from the cricket board and we'd like you to be on the commentary team now, this was during a training camp right so, and i was like what are you talking about i can't i can't commentate in the 2004 i'll be there i'll be playing yeah. <laughs> and whoever's on the other side of the line i remember her name is marina <laughs> a poor lady she was like uh, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, oh, can I call you back another time? I put the phone down. Like, <laughs> I put the phone down. And, and I was like, so now I'm left going, oh dear, what just happened? Yeah. And then I had to go back, find out from team managers and whatever, guys at the training. I'm saying, hey guys, what's going on? I need to understand what's going on. What, what are we talking about here? Uh, if I'm not supposed to be here, why wouldn't you just tell me so? You know, why wouldn't you just say, look, bud, this is not happening. You're not in, you know, and you could sure. give me some sort of reason. And yeah, long story short, it could be sour grapes or whatever. And remember, I regret absolutely nothing. Right. Yeah. And said, oh, I, you could have said sour grapes, blah, blah, blah. And it's not, I just, it's just what happened. And so I might have moped a little bit. I might have gone and. My wife might have borne the brunt of it, you know, to say these guys are terrible. I'd been to the uh, 2002 cha Champions Trophy. You remember the one where, where uh, Gibbs had cramps in Sri Lanka? I don't, I don't yeah. know if you'd remember. I don't know. He had cramps in South Africa were going really well and da, 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 and he had got cramps and he had to go out and then uh, South Africa imploded from there. But I'd been to that two, uh, 2002 Champions Trophy in October and... Next was the World Cup. So I thought, sure. yeah, shoo, and you're in, you know. But sport is like that. It's cutthroat. And someone must decide you're okay, you're not okay, you're doing well, you're not doing well, you deserve another chance, you don't deserve another chance. Such is life. That's what happens, right? But all yeah. things work together for good, right? Um, I ended up commentating and trying to work out within my head whether I want to do it or I don't want to do it. I still didn't know for sure. 2003 World Cup done. 2000 and, so the rest of 2003, carry on playing. Um, 2003 and four, I'd get calls from broadcasters wherever. I think I did the Champions Trophy in 2004 as a commentator. Got called by Sky to say, 
please, can you come and work? Um, I did something else in Dubai and whatever. That, and of course, I'd leave cricket, uh, leave the season, just pop off, go and do this, come back, you know, wait for a month, come back, do it, come back. And it wasn't going to be viable. I had to then make a choice. And yeah. in looking at it soberly, uh, my wife also there and um, checking and saying, look, each time you're coming back here, you're coming back and you're this unhappy guy. And yeah. trying to do this thing that you love so much, uh, maybe it's time to kind of shift along. And yeah, um, I then, actually my wife then, I was aware I was in Pakistan doing commentary rather than playing. And my wife got a call from, from Supersport and asked them to call me when I came back, which was whenever. And the rest is history. So yeah. it's the 2003, 4, 2004, 5. Until now, in 2020, here I am. So I'll say again, I believe it's a path carved by God, not by me, not by my doing. I, nothing I could have done. And look, it's not as if uh, I set the cricketing world alight and therefore everybody said, oh, we've got to have this guy on commentary. No, it doesn't work. It's, it's not like that. Yeah. And that's, that's why even more, I think, yep, that path is preset was preset for me and i just do the best i can now uh, i work hard uh i am quite observant i kind of have developed over the years as a broadcaster um it doesn't just happen you gotta work at it you gotta be cognizant of the things you're meant to do things you're not meant to do uh above all i believe that it comes through that I have an absolute ball when it's broadcasting time, when it's time to watch cricket, because that's what I yeah. love. And the love of the game has never changed. And now what I get is across all the countries, I get to see guys who come from being youngsters in a team, looking talented and end up realizing that and over time become absolute legends of the game. Good example, yeah. you spoke of A.B. De Villiers at the start, see him start up, this guy who dyes his hair blonde, <laughs> who does whatever, and he's talented, you can see, and he goes all the way through, and he's legend. Another guy I'll give an example for, and for, for who, well, for me, who it's actually particularly special because you see those, Makai Antini, um, Jacques Callis, because I know where it started, or I know kind of the beginnings of the professional life for them, for me, whilst being at the academy with these guys. The likes of Brett Lee, because in that academy year, their academy year in Australia came to play against the South African academy. So seeing all these guys go from, they might become cricketers, they might play for Australia, might play for uh, South Africa, might play for Zimbabwe, and some become absolute legends of the game. And on the other side of it, you're sitting there and you're saying, hey, man, do you remember this? And do you remember? And you can reminisce about this stuff. It's, it's precious yeah. and it's a privilege. Yeah, it's amazing how much you can actually pick up just watching the sport and, and being in those setups. Because, I mean, a lot of people will say, but you never played, like for me, example, me, you never played cricket at a high level. How can you be in this industry or give your opinion on certain matters? You see certain things that are cross-relational and in a way the, the relationships are kind of over they cross each other um, in different sports um and i've, I've played other sports um at, at higher levels that that kind of have a similar type of mentality and you use a similar type of um mentorship that you need to be able to take your game to the next level etc but with talking about that when you go to kai majola weeks and you sit there and you watch these players play at this yeah at the lower level and see what goes behind the and how they get to that point you can learn a lot about the game and you learn a lot about it to be able to give your opinion so i think that i don't know what how you what your take is on that um with regards to people and commentary and especially journalism etc when people ask the same about coaching they like they 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 are they always say like you have to be a play the highest level maybe to be a coach some people have that opinion or you have to understand the game at a certain level to be able to be a journalist or be in the industry What's your take on that exactly? So I think that the experience of playing at the highest level is invaluable. 
It's I can't quantify it. There's no way I can. So um, situation occurs uh, and you can relate to it, right? And the more the guys have played, the easier it is sometimes for them to to relate to exactly what the younger guy, the newer guy, um, the less experienced guy is kind of going through and what he is facing. For a person who's never faced that, there is a difficulty. And I use the word difficulty because I don't want to say it's impossible for them to kind of traverse that, that, that part of coaching or of imparting some sort of knowledge or of um, assessing that situation and giving an, an opinion, right? Um, in terms of whether it must be only those who've played or whatever it is um, to coach and to, to give opinion, I don't think so. Uh, I think perspectives have to be different and perspectives are different. So in the area of broadcasting, you will have guys who are journalists and a journalist is different to a commentator. A journalist is different to a former sports person, right? The former sports, sports person, I believe anyway, is one that speaks from an experienced perspective and speaks with regard to his own experiences. So is very subjective and can only really speak that way for a period of time until there's a, a big body of work from which they then draw. And it's no longer about when they play, but just how the game generally plays out as they see it. For journalists, there is the finding of information and giving of information, evidence-based and investigation-based, proved and reproved many times, right? That's what journalists have to do. So I don't think we can equate the people or we can say one is greater than the other one. That's a subjective matter as well. But in a broadcast, I believe that you can have many different types of people in one broadcast who can share a perspective about the same thing and make the experience for whoever is listening, whoever is watching, richer for it. And so, yeah, you, you kind of mix and match. Of course, there'll be more of the former players, but you get, even within the former players, you get former players who, who speak from a, I did this and I did that and I did that. Not so plainly and not so badly in terms of I and I and I and whatever, but because they have the experience and, and whatever. And you get former players who become broadcasters, who yeah. understand that they must tie everything together and that this is supposed to be an experience for whoever is watching, whoever is listening, and they can kind of speak of the game unfolding in its totality rather than hone in on particular uh, issues and kind of get stuck on those. From a coaching perspective, I think you can learn to coach. I think you must have some cricketing experience. I think um, in order to coach at the highest level, unfortunately, I think this, at the highest level, I think there are particular things you have to have experienced in order to be able to do it. If you haven't, and not experienced by be a legend and have played 150 games, no, but uh, have gone right up to the top or pretty close to it, you know, to ensure that you get the thinking of those that are there, the anxieties of those that get there, um, the trials, the tribulations. And then when I say you can learn to coach, even the guys that have played and have had all of that need to be able to get a way to translate what they know into knowledge being transferred, right? If you don't know how to transfer it, then you can't coach anyone, can you? Because by saying it, do it, do it like me is not coaching because not everybody is the same. In fact, everybody is entirely yeah. different. So, yeah, uh, genuinely, that, that's what I think with, with regard to coaching. I think we have to kind of touch on various things and with regard to broadcast and opinion and everyone has one, everyone's allowed to have one. And it's all fine, you know, just as long as we know where that opinion is coming from and, and kind of where we place it and how we take it. Of course. So, Tommy, I mean, this is the section where we're going to go into the comment sections and um, try to ask get some questions from the fans. 
but it's a new thing that I wanted to try because I thought I really need to pay homage to the guy that actually helped me set this up. So I'm going to bring him on screen with you to ask you a few questions. I'm going to Ravi asked if he could. So I'm going to bring him in. <laughs> How's it, Ravi? Uh, I thought this would be a perfect opportunity so for me to say thank you to you for actually helping me set this up as well um, and pushing me to do this because I was a little bit nervous about doing this interview. Um, I have to admit that. Uh, but uh, thanks a lot. So I'm going to open up the floor for you to ask a few questions before we go into the comment section. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Hey, Robbie. How's it? Hi, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, Pavi, um, just from my side, uh, one of my earliest memories of you was watching you uh, bowl at um, the then Goodyear Park in Bloemfontein, and you managed to get Hanty Cronier out. He glanced one uh, to uh, Andy Flower, who was keeper at the time. Um, you did, uh, I think, two tours, one to India, one to the West Indies as well. Who would you say was your most difficult batsman? And I think Kali alluded to this earlier. Who was the most difficult batsman you actually had to bowl to at one point? Uh, I mentioned him earlier. The guy I thought I found most difficult having played, we played Pakistan a lot actually. And the guy I found particularly difficult was, was Saeed Anwar. Probably the one reason, I mean, one reason is because he's a fantastic player. But the other reason that sort of add to that is because he was, uh, he's a left-handed batsman. And it didn't make things easier for me, him being left-handed. Preferred it to sort of go at right-handers. But yeah, I had a touch that was amazing and he could kind of hit you from off stump leg side and from off stump sort of through the off side as well. So, uh, yeah, that was tough. And you're trying to kind of swing it back into his pads and you're going down to find leg for four, you know, and you think, well, I'm not so, you know, that's OK as far as lines concerned. But how is he getting it there? You know, so, yeah, he's one I would say was was very good. He's saying Brian Lara was the breeze. Not at all. I mean, it's, uh, that, that question is that question is always difficult because uh, you you could name absolutely everyone you bowled at um, who then became legend, right? Um, and there are many: um, Tendulkar, Lara, Dravid, oh, name it, all of them: Ganguly, Sehwag, wh whoever you like. Um, Wars, uh, name many other West Indians, name English batsmen who are good players, uh, but. The, the way you separate. And Lara was, look, no, I say nobody, not many could bowl at him because he could hit the ball anyway. But I didn't get to play against him that many times. In fact, I, I remember playing, there's a, there's a particular game that I remember playing against him. It was a warm-up game in, in England in 2000 where we played at Arundel and, and um, it was first class and both West Indies and Zimbabwe were on tour in England, later played a, a one-day series. And I can't remember if it was Nigel Long, but I remember him walking in and me hitting him on the pad and going absolutely crazy and he didn't, didn't get given out. And he proceeded to, like, with precision, just whack the ball through cover, through mid-off, through mid-wicket, you know, and got 100 and then retired. <laughs> you know, so I, I'm not at all saying whoever was a breeze. All of them. Um, I remember a master class from... Um, Sachin Tendulkar in Sharjah in a one-day game where the game before my great mate Henry Olonga who I played with got him out and I think we beat them in that game actually it was a game we played it was a triangular with Sri Lanka we beat them in the game um, that was kind of a dead game because there was that game as the round robin and then there was still the final to play and both us and India had made it into the final and eliminated Sri Lanka. So we had to play this game to finish off and then we had to wait two days to play the last game, which was the final, to see who would win that to take that Charger Cup for, uh, for that particular series. And he got out, and I can't remember if he got up for North, uh, but he nicked off twice. I think he nicked off a no ball and then he nicked off the next ball and was caught at slip twice. It was like carbon copy. And when he turned up the next game, we couldn't bowl at him. We literally didn't know where to bowl. He planted us absolutely <laughs> everywhere. Now, this was the section that was more adventurous at that time. As mm -hmm. time went on with age, I think he became uh, tighter, yeah, tighter, more reserved, still fantastic. And those shots would come out like the punch through mid on would come out every now and again when he put on a show. But 
yeah, I could go on. I could speak about many other batsmen who, you know, would put you to the sword. But if there's one that sticks in my mind, and I, as I say, I preface this with, maybe it's because we played Pakistan a lot and he was left-handed and I got to bowl against him a few times. Said Anwar always sticks in my mind as this guy who was just so good. And uh, on that note, uh, one of my fondest World Cup memories was, well, not exactly fondest, but uh, certainly uh, one I'll never forget, is uh, when uh, Zimbabwe pipped one over South Africa back in 99, and you happened to feature in that game. Um, you, you, mean, oh, you mean when Zimbabwe thrashed South Africa at Chelsea? Is that the one? <laughs> Is that the one you're Everyone, talking about? Everyone wants uh -huh. to save us that day. Okay, yeah, I can't, I, I'm trying. Let me try and get. I uh, don't know. Oh, it, it's. I think that. Yeah, thrash them. They absolutely trounced. Yeah, annihilated. Couldn't, couldn't get anywhere close to 200 and, and, you know, and what? 242, I, I think it was, South African <laughs> chase that day. I was yeah. in high school that time. And let me tell you. Um, Everybody was saying Zimbabwe is going to be walked all over upon last <laughs> the time. Uh, they don't stand a chance. Neil Johns is pretty good, you know, all of those things. And um, I have to say, though, we were glued to our screens. We couldn't believe what we were watching. And it was a very good thing um, for Zimbabwean cricket as well. What was the team talk leading up to the game? Because, I mean, surely you guys must have seen the players. You, you obviously were well acquainted with them at that point. Uh, what was the team talk leading up to that match? Did you guys like think we could actually do this today? We can put one over South Africa. There's no doubt in my mind. I, so, Khaled and I spoke about um, what one of my highlights were. And the 99 World Cup is, is a highlight of mine, mainly for um, how together the team were and the belief that was within the team. So, I don't think, even if and I'll give this to any kid, any sports person now, even if you face a daunting uh, side, daunting opponent, it serves absolutely no purpose for you to feel defeated or to think that you're defeated prior to actually playing the game. There's no point playing. Do you know what I'm saying? You don't get on the field. Because if you get on the field with that um, thinking, then you are going to lose. You know, you're, you, 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 there, there, there is a competitive nature for every single sportsman. There is a will to win for every single team. It has to be there. And everybody on the team must think and try to feel the same way with regard to that. If they don't, then you're struggling. You're starting... 10 meters behind in a 100-meter race. You're not winning that race. You're not catching Usain Bolt if you give him, um, you know, 10, 10 meters as a head start. You're not going to catch him. So in, I don't remember anything specific being said for that particular game. What I do remember, though, is that there was this, this silence um, in warm-up, which was a little bit unusual. And what it said most of the time when that happened is that there was a focus from, from everybody. Uh, it's, that's all I remember. There, there weren't as many jokes during the warm-up, but guys were focused. There was a small talk from uh, Dave Houghton, um, but, and he was a coach at the time, fantastic player for Zimbabwe himself. But there, there wasn't too much else that was said that sort of said, Oh, gee yourself up. Oh, we must beat these guys. No, everybody felt like that for absolutely every game. Even the ones that we would lose, we would go out with exactly the same thought to say, must win today. And maybe you don't start well. Maybe things don't go according to plan and you're unable to pull it back and you end up losing. Such is life. But when you go out at the start, nobody's hit a ball. Nobody's bowled a ball. Nothing. You're all the same. And you've got to believe you've got equal chance of winning. And that's, uh, I suppose, the one of the highest for me about that game. It, the fighting spirit was exhibited among all the players on the day. And um, coming back to South Africa, though, I would say in the last, I'd say 2019 was probably the most tumultuous year in South African cricket since the I think it's fair to say. 
Um, it depends. It depends how much of South African cricket you've seen and been involved in. True. Okay. I would go. For, I would say. I would say, despite despite not being involved, I would say, two thousand was the most tumultuous year. Yeah, look, I mean, that's a fair point to make, I suppose. But um, I, I would say 2019 was a tumultuous lay, a tumultuous year on the basis of a, from a player front, as well as from an administration front as well. Uh, there's been multiple challenges on both sides. Do you feel the changes that were made in the last six months, uh, from a leadership point of view, from the recruitment of new players, new blood as well? Do you feel that those changes? are going to be quite significant. They will uh, certainly uh, gear South Africa or shift South Africa in the right direction in terms of playing a competitive brand of cricket again. Oh, yeah, without doubt. So first, let me start by saying that the cycles have been seen over and over. Um, I'll use Australia as an example. Each time that any country loses many good players at one time. There's this floundering because for a long time, um, there's a belief that is built that your team has the right to win. You know, your team doesn't get beat. Your team um, doesn't perform badly and get bowled out for a hundred. But there isn't ever really the, 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 the acknowledgement of how exceptional those players that maintain that standard for a long time are. There isn't the acceptance of that. It's just taken for granted and taken as what is. So coming back to South Africa, in a time where you lose... Um, Amla, De Villiers, um, Stain, go, go back further to the era slightly before, um, which kind of had to have some patching. Dumini as one of those. Um, I might even go back to Smith and to Callis and, and say, in the time where that happens, there's still this hangover of, this team is a strong team. We're number one in the world. We should be this. We should be that. We should be that. But tell me who has come into the side to average 49.9 as an opener like Smith. Tell me who's in the side to support him like Peterson and McKenzie, who if I put together would probably um, average 42 as you know, as two guys in the spot next to Smith. Tell me who then can average, you know, 52, like Hashim Amla, who walks in at three in that side. Who can average 56, like Callis, who walks in at four in that side. Who can average 52, like De Villiers, who walks in at five. And then to the players who many will say, oh, not, maybe not that good average 45 or 46, like Ashwell Prince, who walks in at number six, slash JP Dumini, who oh, is not that good and blah, 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 but he averages 35, 38, 40, whatever the case may be, and have all those people in one team. And then throw to the other side of the game where, hold on, if you don't get 500 and plenty with Carlos getting a dub, uh, 100 and the Villiers double and Smith 100 and Amla 100 and, you know, Prince pull you out of trouble, get 150 as well or whatever. If you don't have those runs, there's a certain Dale Stain who just runs through everybody. Him, Philander, Morkel, whoever you'd like to name. So look at that side and think, well, oh, hold on. Did we get sucked into... Every player is like this. <laughs> that's what happens. I think you it's are quite for mm. You're mm. fortunate as a side if you have two or three like that in the 111. South Africa had like seven or eight players. Yeah. For a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 
Don't yeah. you worry about what's happened. It's the cycle. It's part of it. And South Africa must start again. There will be those who will stand up. There will be new heroes made. And we'll be speaking in a time to come. And we'll say, wow, look at how this guy has developed. Wow, this guy is legendary. Who would have thought that such and such might have been whatever and might have had such a long career? That's, that's kind of what happens. And that's the beauty of it. You got to watch it from, uh, you know, from a perspective of this will unfold. And this is not me saying, don't criticize. Don't say if guys are playing badly. Don't say if the plans are wrong. Don't, no, I'm just saying, whilst you say that, accept that this is how things play out. A tree grows. You water it, keeps going inch by inch or whatever it is. And mm-hmm. one day you go, wow, have a look at this. What? But it's taken time, hasn't it? It has. Yeah. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Um, oh, I just yeah. I only have a few quick ones, Kali. Don't worry. Uh, you don't have to boot me for quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, I recall you and uh, your kids for that matter are big NBA fans. Jordan or LeBron James? Jordan, man. Just uh, It's probably because of my age. I, uh, as a youngster in, in boarding school, used to play basketball as well with friends, friends who were particularly good at basketball. But Jordan was the man. You know, on that note, I always thought Scotty Pippen was underrated, but that may be for another, a call for another day. No, he wasn't underrated. He did his job. He did well. He was not Jordan. It's just how it is. Life's, life's not fair, right? It's just how it is. <laughs> well, very last one from my side. Uh, Khalid and I are both devout Man United fans. Who do you support? What? Us? I knew you were good guys. I knew you were good guys. <laughs> what? They Let me it. tell you. Okay, I have questions for you. Being, uh, But I, I understand that the age thing might kind of... Uh, and it's a good thing. Favorite Man I'm United player? No, 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 I'm, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> Would you hear that favorite Man United. United. If you, I want to know. Favorite United player? Ooh, that's a tough if one, eh? If you could pick one player, right? Tell, okay, I'll, I'll give you two. The reason I'll give you two is which player made you support United? That's a better and question. <laughs> which player is your favorite Man United player? The player that funnily enough got me hooked onto the game was Ryan Giggs, without a doubt. Giggsy, all the way. For me, it was David Beckham. And I liked uh, Keane's leadership. He used to pull guys into order. And I think that was a fundamental reason why they were so successful. Mm. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, so you guys. Me, it was, like, yeah, go, go, go on, Khaled. So, for me, it was. So, I grew up in Holland for three years when I was younger, grade one, two, and three. And um, so, 98, 99, 2000, around about that year. So, the first time my father was a United supporter through the dark ages. And um, I never really. I saw United, a United game, Tottenham played United. Uh, I mean, and then Beckham scored that crazy goal from out of the box <laughs> to uh, basically win us the league. So that was the game. And then I bought, my father still bought me a poster of David Beckham with Brooklyn Beckham on his shoulders and he had the medal around his neck. And that was on my, since then it was David Beckham. Until obviously when we came back to South Africa, I started watching more. And uh, when we got satellite TV, because obviously we couldn't watch a lot of games and etc. So Ronaldo became my guy looking up because. So, I mean, I found that he was. This, I still watch the, the the game that of Sporting versus United on Emu TV. I still remember watching that game, and when I saw that Ronaldo, I was like, "Who's this boy?" And then I just forgot about him until we uh, I heard that we signing this Ronaldo boy, and I said, "Oh, it's that same guy." Did my research, found out we born on the same birthday. We had the same share, the same birthday. <laughs> 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 Are you the same age? No, 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 I'm, I'm you not the same. Age. No, we're not the same oh, age. Okay. So that was a pretty, that <laughs> wow. I remember watching that game. I felt so humiliated for United after that game because Ronaldo made us look very stupid after that. <laughs> and, uh, I was so delighted to hear two weeks later we made an offer uh, for him. So I was just uh, ecstatic about that. I think as I got older and watched all the games and got more into the love for football. Um, I actually have my own publication called United Fanatics magazine um, that I started uh-huh. up 
first. That was my actual passion at the beginning when I just came out of high school. It just got too expensive to run because of image rights, etc. So yeah. I moved over to cricket when I came into the industry. But with regards to United, I think I've got, I got a more um, respect for a guy like Paul Scholes and the way he just completely dominated a game, passed the ball around, controlled games, and a guy like Roy Keane. So I became fans of midfield, the central midfielders, more as I got a little bit older and started watching more, more football, etc. So that would be, I think, Paul Scholes would be the ultimate guy for me. <laughs> so my guy, so, my, so the reason I love United is because of Brian Robson. Steely. He was legendary. Um, under so, if there's ever an underrated person, that's in my opinion, and it might be more rated if you go into football circles in England. But that was the guy. Uh, moved from Middlesbrough to United with Ron Atkinson and all of that, and just outstanding, just a workhorse. And watching him made me watch football. And so made me follow him rather than follow the side. And the rest is history. I started following the side, read up a little bit on it, and, 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 and. But my favorite player, and it, he only pips the other guy, right? My favorite player is Paul Scholes. No word. No question. If I have to pick one, that's who I pick every single time. He pips Eric Cantona. Just pips him. Wow. So, yeah. And these days, so I go through years, right? My favorite United player of all time is Paul Scholes. Uh, these days, my favorite player doesn't even get on the field anymore. And he's slow as a cart horse. But I love him. Method. I love him. No. Juan Mata. That's oh. who I like. Yeah. Uh, amazing amazing guy as well. Amazing yeah, what I, I love touch players. So Berbatov, Bergkamp. Juan Riquelme, guys like that, you know, who in the Iesta, you know, guy, Pirlo, guys who just control the game. I like Pogba. I think he's a top player. I know he's insolent and he can behave badly and all the rest of it. I'm uninterested in that. I like what he does on the football field. He can, he's got touch, you know? Yeah. Love it. And I'll never, I used to watch a lot of the, I watch a lot of youth football with regards to United. So all the youth games under 21, all of that stuff I watched. And I remember watching Pogba play in that youth team. He just dominated everybody. <laughs> it was like, there's no, out of what you're doing at the 23, you should be mm. playing, playing in the senior team. So it was quite sad when he left initially because I was like, oh, this is going to be my favorite player. <laughs> then, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but Ravi, thanks a lot for coming on. Um, I'm sure Pommy will come in the future again and we can have a more better discussion just about United, maybe in the future. <laughs> but uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks for coming on. Bye bye. So that was amazing. Thank you a lot, Pommy. I'm just going to get into a few fan questions before you get going. I know I've nope. taken a lot of your time. Um, hey, you got nowhere to go. I'm locked down. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into one over here with um, Ntebo. She says, um, who would you see, who, who would you say has been the batsman and best bowlers you have seen since being a broadcaster? Oh, so the best bowler, uh, by a long way, I think is Dale Stane. I think he's an absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. guy. Uh, he's sort of bordering on the greatest fast bowler in my books. Wow. Okay. And uh, I say that not lightly because there are many great fast bowlers. So I put him um, up with and understand also that it's difficult to judge eras. It's difficult to kind of equate and, and make sure that you differentiate correctly why this one's better and why that one isn't. So Malcolm Marshall is up there when you see video and you saw him as he bowled he's man magnificent um wasim akram uh brilliant as well um curdley ambrose and 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 glenn mcgrath as favorites i mean they're, they're there as favorites and i'm not sure because this is subjective i'm not i'm not sure if others would choose the same guys you know uh, with regard to them being kind of the greatest. And when you go to the older guys, I'm, I'm unable to, to go with them. You know, uh, 
Lily Thompson, Holding, um, Croft, Garner, Roberts, all those guys. I see their stuff. I see their numbers, but I didn't broadcast when they when they played. Um, I didn't play against them, um, so I, I'm, I'm not really able to to cover them. But since broadcasting, I would say Dale Stang's the best I've seen. Cool. So this next question is uh, it's quite dear to me because I I know that you do watch a lot of domestic cricket as well, and um, I respect that a lot about you. So tell me which local South African players that haven't yet earned a national call-up do you believe have a massive future? Oof, that's, a, it's, that's a difficult question. Um, massive future is a, is a kind of uh, guillotine. Yeah, it's a, it's a shadow over a bloke's head. You know, you're trying to forecast and, and you're trying to, to pick out who might. But we, there's so many different things that go into um becoming mm -hmm. and by that i mean you can have guys who uh have the prerequisites what we think are the prerequisites but they actually never get there or when they get to the stage they are unable to translate their talent into results and therefore into holding a place and becoming um good and great players in the game so yeah I, as a as a question, I wouldn't be able to, off the top of my head, say this guy definitely. Um, and I think that says something in itself. So, yeah, yeah. I, I'm thinking, sort of going around the traps, and I, I can't think of anyone, not off the top of my head, who I'd say definitely this guy. We've got to keep watching and, and so forth. There are guys who've been yeah. picked already who kind of had a bit of a go um, and haven't quite made it. Who are, as far as I'm concerned, who are okay and who will do all right. So. Someone like a, uh, a Zubair Hamza, uh, I've said to colleagues a lot of the time that what I like about him, despite his technical flaws that have been evident when he's been at the highest level, is he, there's just something about his, his endeavor. So he looks like he, he's streetwise from a cricket perspective. Yeah. He, he's just always seeking out runs. And I can't quantify that. So when you watch, you see certain things and sometimes you can't. And I suppose that is the skill sometimes. Sometimes we can, perhaps we can as commentators more than many uh, kind of bring our thoughts to the fore by describing certain things and certain players in certain ways. But I see him as a guy who I go, wow, there, there's something about his endeavor. There's something about his smarts where he's trying to get runs in a way that others don't really and his yeah. steeliness of mind that seems to come through so he's one who i think despite having gone up and kind of been moved aside a little bit i think that will do him good and i think he'll do big things for for south africa how big i don't know but yeah, yeah. i admire the way he looks certainly yeah Z Z zubair is someone that um i, I chat to quite a bit and we have a, a decent relationship i would say and I know his story quite well, and if you know his story as well, you know, so the guys out there that are watching, um, he's someone that never would, went through the channels like a normal cricketer kind of, you say, would in this generation, where they go through pro provincials, SN19, get the, all those type of, have a great coke week and then make it into the national sides, except like the VM Mulders that you know, etc. He was a little bit more tough. He played club cricket from a very young age and um, he battled his way through the teams, battled his way through high school, battled in the provincial team, didn't get the SM19, didn't get picked there. Kai Majoli pick, he didn't do that well for province. So he really battled through his whole career. And I think that's what makes him a little bit different to some other guys that just got it handed to them. So that's qualities maybe that you are seeing in him. Yeah. So, yeah, um, and, and, and can I suggest something to you, Khalid, yeah. that, that we get, we get, we rid ourselves of the phrase, got it handed to them. Because yeah. even those who go through the system and get the opportunity, it's not handed to you. It yeah. never is. It's tough. And unfortunately, in trying to describe and sometimes in falling into a camp or having an affinity with with situation x rather than situation y we can be careless with our words and make it seem like the player oh he gets everything and it doesn't matter which player it is 
Each player must strive hard to be good enough to then get the selection and then try and show how good they can be. It doesn't get handed to you ever. Yeah, that's actually true. So that phrase of words was wrong <laughs> because you can see that with someone like Bian Mulder, who he, mm. he might have had a quick rise, mm. but injury set him back. Everybody was hating him the next best thing. And he we spoke before on this platform and he said that it's probably the hardest year in his life in cricket. We the last couple of months we just didn't know what was happening. It just it just happened the way it was, and he had no control over it. So you're 100 percent correct about that um going forward so um another one is from verne rasmus he wants to know which game did you enjoy commentating the most or which is the most memorable to you <laughs> verna you know what um i was doing an interview with ian bishop yesterday um chatting to him on a zoom call um and i was saying to him it's crazy how games merge into one so you remember moments and you remember things that happen and then when someone says okay yeah where was this game and uh, what happened here and even when it comes to playing there's some who remember that who remember just about everything even if they've played so sean pollock who played yeah, millions of games remembers just about he remembers everything it, and i don't know why that happens it's just a good memory or whatever but he, he remembers absolutely everything. Me who played uh, not many internationals, I merge games. Like I, I remember something happening in a game I played in whatever, and then I remember something else and I think that's the same game. And guys go, no, that's not the same. Those are like five <laughs> games apart. Or that was on the next tour or that was, do you know what I mean? So yeah, that's hard for me with, um, yeah. with regard to commentary, uh, particularly if you put the, the word enjoy in there um because enjoy i enjoy it. most games <laughs> if i am to pick one if i am to pick one i would pick the test match um of 2000 and is it 2008 yeah 2008 um jp dumini debut um oh, um, Dean Elgar debut, Ashwell Prince injured at Perth, Mitchell Johnson ripped through South Africa, took five wickets for three runs. And, uh, at the end of the day, towards the end of a session and the, you know, it might've been, I think the end of the second day, if I remember right. And it, it, it looked for all money. Like that was the end of that. And I think Australia had got 300 in their first innings. Um, and walking down the stairs at the WACA um, to walk back to the hotel, I used to walk through the botanical gardens, um, park or whatever it was, to get to the hotel we stayed at. As we're walking down the stairs, we could hear the punters talking, um, saying, oh, mate, I thought these lot were going to be quite good, mate. This is done, Mike. You know, and we just listened. <laughs> uh, we just listened and walked along. And to be fair, uh, their view was not a a bad view in light of what had just happened. But as you know, Test match cricket, so much yeah, can well, happen exactly. over a period of time. So coming back and and watching the rest of that and calling the rest of that was just magnificent. From um, I think it was 90. I don't remember if Smith got a whole lot of runs. I don't think he did it. He might have got a few. But fast forward to day four, the end of day four, and South Africa suddenly in a place where they're in the driving seat. They've bowled out Australia again. Um, and there's a lot of time left in the game. And they've batted well in that part of that final session with Smith having started really well up at the top. And... Amla having batted quite decently as well. And then Cullis, I think he might have got out at the end of that day, but he came in and blitzed it. And I think he might have, if he didn't get 42, he got 62, something like that, right? But suddenly there was this, there's a day to go. And in terms of number of runs, even though South Africa are chasing 414, there's time they could get the runs. It doesn't, it doesn't look like 
And there's nothing in there that's suggesting that they're not going to get him. Uh, and I remember Kept Lavesels uh, saying, and I don't know if he'd admit to saying this, by the way, <laughs> um, considering that he now lives in Australia, I don't know if he'd admit to saying this. <laughs> he said, mate, they've got nothing. This is a win. <laughs> that's what he said. And he said this before, the day before. So we're at the end of the day, where we go. Came back the next day. Um, Dumini having got a duck, I think. He got a duck, I think, first. So he got four and then got bounced out or something. Um, Elga got a duck. But Dumini and, and um, De Villiers batted together. Long partnership. De Villiers with a, a century. Totally dominated. And South Africa chased down 414. And won comfortably in the end. That stayed, it remains in my head, that game, because of the way that it played out, the way it went left and right and left and right and was never really in the middle and in the balance. So, yeah. Uh, Verna, I hope, yeah, I could name many more, but that one came to mind uh, in, in terms of answering that question. Let's see if we can bait you into doing this. I'm not 100% sure, but, uh, but I don't know if... Him saying that he's calling you a legend, you have to see that. But that catchphrase that will remain with everybody forever. That's him got him gone. Can you give us that catchphrase? And no, how that no. It's, 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 it's got uh, it's 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 uh it's gotta be in the moment. So and you have to understand this. And you have to understand this. I, it's not as if I just, I think about it. I don't. <laughs> In the excitement of the moment, it comes out. And I, and I want you to know this as well. I try hard not to say it. <laughs> I try so hard not to say that. But uh, sometimes the excitement is too much. I can't hold back. I can't hold myself. And there it goes. So, yeah. yeah. So, so, we'll, so hopefully we're back commentating sometime again and, and it can happen. And Mohammed, you, you'll hear it there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Bobby. This was an amazing, amazing conversation. I really enjoyed it. And I hope I can get you back on here again in the future now that we've, we've spoken. Um, I just wanted you to maybe just give one word to your fans and maybe some one word to the cricket fanatics fans obviously that also have also asked me to get you on this platform so the floor is yours just to fans, say a few words. fans what fans i don't want to have fans man <laughs> well then at least give it to the cricket fanatics fans out there that are <laughs> okay well, whoopsie <laughs> okay well to the cricket fanatic let's go i don't have fans what we'll have fans for <laughs> come on <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, to the Cricket Fanatics fans, I say keep watching. Um, you know, we all they love this game. And in some way or other, we are involved in it. And in whatever way that we take it in, we see through the lockdown um, that it's a privilege to just be able to, you know. Uh, there you go. So uh, keep enjoying it. Um, keep watching and keep tuning in to, to Cricket Fanatics. I, ha I hadn't before, so I'll be tuning in now as well. Hey, follow me on Instagram as well. And yeah. maybe we'll collaborate and do some stuff on Instagram. Awesome. How about that? There you go. That's perfect. Thank you very much, um, for me. And Werner, I want to leave you with. Not through for me. I'm a huge fan. So that's what he had to say to you. <laughs> Cheers, Werner. I've got one. I've got one. <laughs> Maybe a few more. And my mom and my wife and my two kids. I'll have five. There you go. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, Bobby. Okay. Enjoy and good luck and safe to all your family. And your, and I hope you guys stay safe in lockdown and your friends and family that are all safe and you as well. Um, stay healthy and safe. Uh, all right. I'll chat you again. Thank Cheers, you. Bye.